believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
far as the scripture goes today. Wisdom comes from God. And there's a very real practical sense of knowing what to do, how to do, and when to do it, and why it must be done. However, having wisdom is no guarantee that we will always act wisely. And this passage that we've just read in 1 King is repeated in 2 Chronicles. And, you know, if Mama had to tell you something twice, she really meant it. But don't let her have to get to that third time. And then when she puts her middle name in there, too, then you know you're in trouble. But this act of praise for Solomon's generosity and Solomon's life thus far and humility and asking for wisdom can teach us all valuable lessons. So if God handed us a blank check and we could ask him for anything and know we receive it, like the genie and the lamp stories, what would you ask for? Longevity, fame, power. We could ask for wealth, but we already know that that does not bring happiness. Benjamin Franklin is quoted saying, if a man could have half his wishes, he would double his troubles. Well, God did give Solomon that blank check in verse 7. Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And he responded spiritually, not selfishly or materialistically. So God gave him the wisdom Solomon asked for, and much more. A little tiny bit of history. So Solomon became king of Israel around the age of 12. So he was an almost teenager that knew to ask God for help in ruling his country. He ruled for about 40 years. And the son of King David, he also began his rule with an act of public worship at Gibeon, which they say is about six miles northwest of Jerusalem. And that's where David had left the Ark of the Covenant, you know, after its time wandering through the desert for many years and place to place as the Israelites were in and out of wars um, throughout their early history. Um, and this was regarded at the time as Israel's religious center, that camp set up basically at Gibeon, um, until it was replaced by Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. We all probably have different pictures in our minds of what the perfect sanctuary looks like and where it is. I've been lucky to worship in many different places, different denominations, even ecumenical services, from fancy cathedral buildings to churches like this one with the beautiful stained windows and fancy organ, um, on down to just a plywood stage in a park. In large crowds, thousands of people, small congregations are my favorite, and even alone in my yard or at the piano. Um, God is always present, always watching, always listening for his beloved children. And whatever our sanctuary looks like, God is enthroned through the worship of his people. Like Psalm 33 says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So while at Gibeon asleep one night, God comes to Solomon in a dream. And Solomon has realized how enormous of a task he had in front of him, the position he was being entrusted with. He had hoped to carry on and improve upon the legacy of his father David. Solomon knew that God was the reason for David's success and blessings. He also knew that holding the kingdom together was not going to be an easy task. He and his brothers were trying to take over and wanting to start wars. So King Solomon, as a young boy, had to fight him off. He was raised in the palace with all the luxuries imaginable. But he still came to this responsibility with eyes open, not spoiled. He knew how hard it was going to be. And his desire was to honor God and to serve his people. If you've ever held a position of leadership, you might understand how smart Solomon's request was. The power of a king can become a very heady thing. Realizing his limitations, he confessed his need for guidance and wisdom to rule properly. Solomon also understood it was by God's authority that 
he was placed on the throne. As stated by David, the heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord. In verse 9, Solomon acknowledges that God has given him the kingship and alludes to the covenant God made with Abraham that the Jewish nation would be as numerous as the grains of sand. He is now a part of that covenant, a continuation of the pledge God made with his people, a reminder that, yeah, God keeps his promises. There was a condition to God's response, though. Solomon had to live according to God's commands, as had David. Fulfilling his father's last wish, Solomon, with a grateful heart, built a magnificent temple, the symbol of God's presence with his chosen people. And he publicly expressed his debt to God before the ark with sacrificial offerings. Israel finally had a permanent place of worship. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had placed in his heart in 2 Chronicles. Much of the wisdom literature of the Bible is written by Solomon. He experienced doubt and despair chronicled in Ecclesiastes. He wrote about love in Song of Songs. And he shared his understanding of different life situations in parts of the Psalms and Proverbs. He was touched by God and thankfully shared this wealth of wisdom with us. But what exactly is wisdom? It's not some mystical intuition that comes from thin air or the position of the stars, nor is it the accumulation of wisdom. I mean, computers compile extensive amounts of data. But I don't know if any of us would actually call Siri or Alexa wise. <laughs> um, wisdom, again, is a very real, practical sense of what to do, how to do it, why it must be done. Wisdom also is more than common sense, because a wise person may not always choose a common, easy answer, because that might not be what God deems the best choice. And knowledge alone isn't enough either. You could surround yourself with the best and brightest of every field. That still doesn't mean you're going to make a wise decision. And there's a reason why the serenity prayer is so powerful to so many. It was written by an American theologian, a seminary professor for more than 30 years, and a well-regarded author, Reinhold Neighbor wrote this in 1932, and later in, I believe it was 1964, he won the Presidential Freedom Award for his writings. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. That last line is the hard part, the wisdom to know the difference. A person who is wise is someone with the uncommon ability to see what has happened, appraise what has happened, anticipate what might happen, evaluate various courses of action, and then make a dis sensible decision, choosing the right path and acting upon it. Kind of like you would hope your medical team would be in an emergency, or the officers at the scene of an accident. There are many times when we need those people who can make those quick, wise decisions. <coughs> but such discernment does not come from one's own resources. It is a gift from God. Solomon opens the book of Proverbs by declaring, the first step in learning is bowing to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom and learning. Because if we don't acknowledge God, we're certainly not going to benefit from his guidance. Sometimes, when we're after something, no matter how difficult or easy it may be, it requires a bit of persistence. If we deem that the goal is worth the price, then we're going to go after it. If we're motivated enough, we'll do whatever it takes to achieve our goals. What is one thing that you would stop at nothing to get? 
What is it at the top of your list of things to pursue? In Proverbs 3, we are told that wisdom should be put at the top of that list. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her, those who hold her fast and are called blessed. So the main point of that passage to me is pretty clear. Put wisdom at the top of your list of things to go after. Set your sights on gaining wisdom. Okay, so if we're going to do this, we need some reasons why. Why should we pursue wisdom like this? What's the benefit? Well, according to the Bible, wisdom is the ability to make godly choices. There are a lot of other wisdoms out there, but the unique thing about biblical wisdom is that it comes only from God. It comes only through a faith relationship with Jesus Christ, trusting in Him and placing your life fully under His authority. The goal is to glorify God. Now, there are a lot of people that operate according to worldly wisdom instead of biblical wisdom. And the Bible has a few words for them, but one is repeated many times. Fools. A fool's source of wisdom comes from human minds and human ideas. Fools do not acknowledge God and have not committed their lives to trusting Him and placing their lives under His authority. And the goal of worldly wisdom is personal gain, not glorifying God. Biblical wisdom is living under the authority of God and His Word. And it's the ability to apply God's Word in your life. There are some objections that people might have to pursuing this kind of wisdom, though. Some might think, well, wisdom is fine, but I am too busy with my life to devote time to pursuing it. I've got to work, I've got to make dinner, I've got to go get the kids, oh, I've got to go pick up the grandkids, I've got to drop the grandkids off at soccer practice. Many things pile up on us during the week. But taking the time and devoting it to study and worship, that's what we mean by priorities. What are your priorities? Because basically you're saying, well, my life is too busy and too important to pay attention to what God's Word says. And we actually miss the whole point of that passage. Because it's not putting wisdom before your life. The point is that wisdom is the key that unlocks the truly good things in life. If you want to be truly successful in life, pursue wisdom. Okay, well I can hear the teenagers now though. Wisdom making the biblical choices, is boring. I just want to have fun. I might also think the wisdom is not for people who want to have fun. Well, there's good news for them and us. God doesn't hate fun. I mean, he invented it, right? <laughs> but it does dishonor God when we make fun our priority instead of him. Living and making choices in the light of God's truth actually makes fun more fun than worldly fun. Like that verse 17 said, Wisdom's ways are pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. The kind of fun that wisdom leads us to is not the kind of fun that is at the expense of others. It is the fun that glorifies God. Okay, so then here's the one. Well, wisdom's just for the smart people. If your objection to pursuing wisdom is that it's only for smart people, there again, it's good news for you. Wisdom is intensely practical, even logical. It's for people who are trying to grind it out one day at a time. 
Wisdom influences things like successful relationships and using your words for good. It's not about how smart you are. It's about your desire to please God by applying his truth to your life. There are those who say, well, I've tried to gain biblical wisdom, but I'm just not seeing the results promised here. Well, that statement is based on a common misunderstanding of what God's word is all about. The promises here are not hard, fast, absolute promises of exactly what's going to happen. They are things likely to happen if we make wise choices. They are the real life examples told us from thousands of years ago that still apply. The blessings of long life, riches, and honor are not necessarily what's going to happen here on earth. They could, sure. And having wisdom and applying it will surely help advance in your career, the choices you make with finances and personal relationships. But remember, being saved by Jesus Christ means that we already have an everlasting life and all the glories and riches of heaven are ours. Like Paul said in Ephesians 1, <clears throat> In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Wisdom is the ability to make godly choices. It's living in the light of God's word and acting accordingly. Unfortunately, you can't just find wisdom or buy it off a shelf in Walmart. It takes intentional, committed decisions to pursue it. And when we choose to do this, God promises to help us. Does having wisdom guarantee that we will always act wisely? Unfortunately, no. Even Solomon, who was recognized as the wisest of kings, made foolish choices at times. Still, his 40 years on the throne are known as the golden age of Israel. He negotiated treaties that ensured economic growth and stability. He kept diplomatic and commercial lines open that maintained peace. Solomon's building projects, like the temple, gave Israel a sense of national pride and security that it had never known before. By any standard, Solomon was a great king, but he was prepared for greatness because of where he had placed his priorities. God first. Though he didn't ask for wealth, God gave Solomon great riches, and God will meet our material needs also. But if we aren't content with what we have, we will never be satisfied with what we get. In Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do we desire God's blessing? Do we seek his wisdom? Or are we going to go it alone in life? We possess the greatest book of wisdom, yet we remain unwise in so many ways by not heeding the voice of God in all we do. Knowing truth isn't helpful until we are willing to be transformed by it. We will be given opportunities to use the guidance God has offered. Many receive advice, only the wise profit by it. As Jesus said in Matthew 11:19, 19, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds.
Grant, O Lord, that what has been said with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts we may practice in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us. God bless you until we meet again.